Plate tectonics is a well understood and well established theory. And I use the term theory there as it should be, scientifically. The expanding earth theory, however, seems to continue being a thing for some people. And I use the correct definition of theory there as well. So what happens when someone thinks that problems with plate tectonics points to an expanding earth? <laughs> Hello all and welcome along to another episode of Tin Four Tuesday with me, Simon Dan. Thank you very much for joining me. Before we begin today, a quick reminder, if you're doing the 2021 book club and want to be included in the live show for the review of The Ascent of Gravity, then the application form is in the description. There are three places up for grabs. Right, back to today's video where See the Pattern has found seven major problems with plate tectonics that point to an expanding Earth. Away we go. There are many problems with the current model of plate tectonics, some small and some major. A lot of these problems simply disappear when we examine a model where the Earth itself is expanding rather than the continents moving. Let's run through the top problems with the current plate tectonics model. Number one, the subduction of plates. There are many different versions of the expanding Earth model, and one of the main differences between them is whether they accept or reject the concept of subduction. Subduction, of course, is where an oceanic plate is forced underneath a thicker continental plate. The best example of this is, of course, where the Nazca plate subducts beneath the South American plate, causing the Andes. It is clear, however, that they are both at odds with the concept of subduction put forward by plate tectonics. The main differences come down to how far down this subduction continues. Plate tectonics would have this going on for thousands of kilometres, which, as we have discussed in the episode What Drives the Plate Movements, cannot really occur. That's because they don't subduct thousands of kilometres. Maybe just a thousand. But after that, the pressure and temperature are far too great. Recent high-resolution global mantle tomographic models provide images of subduction zones very different from the expected ones. The narrow high-velocity zones under the Asiatic circum-Pacific arcs appear not to be prolonged towards the lower mantle, but instead deflect horizontally into or under the 400 to 700 km transition zone and a horizontal flow must be admitted. In some cases, it even appears as if the leading edge has an upward motion. This presents a problem for the normal plate tectonics. As the plates reach a depth of 700 kilometers, its own decreasing buoyancy should pull the rest of the plate with it and plunge it towards the mantle. Why would an entire plate, which weighs trillions and trillions of tons, be pulled into the mantle by a relatively smaller area that is receding into an area which, let's remember, is not a liquid? But here we are seeing something very different. The motion is not downwards. In some cases, it is even upwards. Experiments conducted with different kinds of slabs show that stiff slabs tend to curl like wood shavings and weak slabs tend to undergo retrograde subduction, none of which fit with a standard tectonics model. We're talking about tectonic plates here. It's very difficult to represent that in an experiment. High resolution images of the mantle plumes under the major hotspots show that the plumes can be followed up to at least 800 kilometers in a nearly vertical manner. With little to no deviation, this strongly suggests that there can be no convective circulation processes going on. Well, funny enough, the Society Islands are right near the Pacific Plate boundary. What if this point in your image is where the convection currents rise to the surface? Number two, distortions in the reconstruction of Pangaea. When we examine the reconstruction of Pangaea, there are certain artifacts that present plate tectonics with some major problems. Large tears are observed in the reconstruction of Pangaea that appear crossed by huge inlets like the Tethys Sea, the Arctic Sinus, and the Austral Sinus. Another problem is that the remainder of the Earth was covered in an ocean which covered more than one hemisphere. The age of this ocean is greater or equal to the Triassic. This means that a vast amount of oceanic lithosphere 
needs to be completely consumed during the post-Triassic times. Add into this that we should expect to find the remains of this pre-Triassic floor in each of the many tiers or sinuses, yet we do not. So in order to get around this problem, they need to devise even more complex models to explain how the oceanic floor in each of these sinuses was removed. We have to remember here that oceans doesn't necessarily mean oceanic crust. A lot of seas actually sit on continental crust. And the subduction of that oceanic crust is a perfect process that explains where that oceanic crust went. Remember, we're talking about over 300 million years ago here. Plenty of time for those changes to occur. Number three, the coincidence of ocean floor ages. Another problem relates to the maximum age of any of our ocean or sea floor beds. Their maximum age is the Jurassic, and this presents a major problem as the ocean floors do not move at the same rate. The Pacific one moves at five times the rate of the Atlantic. If the Pacific had moved at a rate just a little slower, it should have been sufficient to expose the Triassic floor bed. A rate just a little faster would have completely erased the Jurassic seafloor bed in the Pacific. Yet, we have the uncomfortable scenario that all the seabeds have the same maximum seafloor bed age. I think what you're completely negating here is the fact that this evidence strongly favours seafloor spreading. If the Earth was indeed expanding as you say, then surely we would see oceanic crust that is billions of years old. Yet we do not. Number four, the triple point paradox. Understanding the concept of plate tectonics is normally explained as a simple process. One end is being subducted while new material is created at the other end. This movement occurs for each plate and causes the continents to move. The problem is that the plates are not aligned in simple slices. Instead, there are many plates that have three boundaries, meaning plates have to pivot. Plate tectonics prescribes that the motion between two plates is governed by a rotation around the common pole. The problem is that when we deal with three plate boundaries, each pair of plate boundaries requires its own pole, so three poles, which clearly creates a paradox, as you cannot rotate a plate around three different poles, meaning we cannot apply the rules of plate tectonics to these situations. Now there's seven of these triple points all over the globe, but what we have to remember is that these triple points are constantly evolving. The plate boundaries around these points often change in relatively short geological timescales, a little longer than a human lifespan. Number five, the shape conformities in the Pacific. One of the arguments for plate tectonics was the conformity between the outline of Africa and South America, and we can easily see this in the reconstruction of Pangaea. The problem is that we can also find this shape conformity on the other side of South America with Australia and New Guinea, and this is not possible in the standard tectonics, as these continents were nowhere near each other when they were part of Pangaea, and are actually moving towards each other. The only way we can end up with conformity on both sides of South America is if the whole planet was smaller and these were all touching. It doesn't matter how many times you look at it, South America and Australia do not fit together. Number six, paleontological paradoxes. Further problems persist with the idea of a Pangaea when we examine the flora and fauna. There is a strong similarity between the Ordovician nautiloids of Tasmania with the Asiatic and Laurentian ones. When we examine the Silurian, there is a strong correspondence in the similarities between the planktonic floras of the Canning Basin in Western Australia and those found in the USA. Okay, does strong similarity mean exactly the same? Does it? Or does it mean possibly that they went on similar evolutionary paths? The Vonian vertebrate fossils of South America have been found displaying close similarities with the correspondent faunas of Antarctica, Australia and South China. These facts testify to the fact that these locations must have been much closer together, which they cannot have been in a Pangaea reconstruction. Okay, but Pangaea existed 300 million years ago. The Devonian period, as you say, was between 420 and 360 million years ago. 60 million years too early. 
So your point is irrelevant. Fossil bones of the Triassic reptile Lystrosaurus have been found in Gondwana in India, but also in many places in Eurasia, which should have been separated by the wide Tethys Sea. Oh no, a species that lives in two different places. That can't happen, can it? Number seven, India's movement. The original position of India when it was part of Pangaea versus its later location. If India had indeed travelled up and towards Eurasia and turned in the process, we would expect there to be magnetic anomalies compared to its resting place. No linear magnetic anomalies have ever been found. But why would we expect magnetic anomalies and where? You can't just say that and then expect it to be true. However, if you look into it, you will find that there are magnetic anomalies in the Indian Ocean. Would you look at that? In the next part, we will examine the main problems of dramatic changes in the climate and the wandering pole and see if an expanding Earth can bring a different perspective to this. Which it can't, much like this one. Maybe we'll check that one out too, who knows. But for now, we are done with another Tinfoil Tuesday and I think it's safe to say that the Earth is not expanding. Thank you all very much for watching today. I really, really appreciate it. If you enjoyed it, then please, please do like the video and subscribe as well if the feeling takes you. I have been Simon Dan, have yourselves a great week, and I'll see you all on Friday where I take on another flat earther bet. 10,000 pounds is coming. See you then.